In his book, Natural Born Cyborg, Andy Clark makes the argument that we as humans have a plastic brain that essentially allows us to very easily and naturally incorporate technologies into our body in order to enhance the way that we live, we move, we work, etc. He gives a lot of examples of technologies that humans have already incorporated so fully within them that when using them, they don't even realize that they're referring to them, things like watches or pencils or even a hammer, for instance. And so the argument is that because our brains are so plastic and so easily incorporate technologies, is that we're natural born cyborgs. Um, and here, obviously, the definition of cyborg is a human that uses technology in a very fluid and transparent way. Clark mentioned some aspects of being human that are affected by uh, the cyborg nature. Uh, things like location, where we understand we are, proprioception, um, and senses of embodiment. Clark invokes Stellark and his robotic contraptions that turn him into a very opaque cyborg. And he says that um, these performances are evidence of the remarkable capacity of the human brain to learn new modes of controlling action. And he adds that the, um, we reach a point then where such control is so easy and fluent that all we experience is a fluid, apparently unmediated mesh between will and motion. So he's talking then about the seamless, transparent melding of technologies into the body. So essentially, technologies and being cyborg allows us to extend our body, allows us to exist in multiple locations, um, and, and transforms the way that our mind understands the self. Okay, so at the end of the book, Clark writes, as identity becomes fluid, embodiment multiple, and presence negotiable, it is the perfect time to take a new look at who, what, and where we are. Now, even though Clark is invoking a discussion of embodiment, proprioception, location, with a discussion of the mind, I really think that his whole argument is pretty Cartesian in nature, and really he's only concerned with the ways that technologies affect the mind. And as sort of evidence of this, perhaps, at the very end of his book on the last page, he writes, our most significant technologies are those that allow our thoughts to go where no animal thoughts have gone before. It is our shapeshifter minds, not our space roving bodies, that will most fully express our deep cyborg nature. He adds, the very best of these technological resources are not so much used as incorporated into the user herself. They fall into place as aspects of the thinking process. And then he mentions that this transforms our sense of self, of location, of embodiment. But I think it's really obvious here at the end that he's really just concerned with the mind. So as a result, I think one of the biggest issues with Clark's text is actually the title. A cyborg in Donna Haraway's terms, and Haraway is, as we all know, like the mother of cyborg theory, um, there is absolutely no split between the mind and the body. Likewise, in Hales' is post-human, she argues that the mind and body become a unity rather than two separate entities. Now, even though Clark, I feel, isn't really making this argument, I still feel that his entire text matches up more closely with um, Hales' post-human rather than Haraway's cyborg. So to read a piece of how we became post-human, that I feel matches up well with Clark's argument, becoming a post-human means much more than having prosthetic devices grafted onto one's body. It means envisioning humans as an information processing machine with fundamental similarities to other kinds of information processing machines. So I like the way that she can 
um, refers to the post-human as an information processing machine because that's what I feel Clark's argument is. So even though there are some issues with what Clark's position is relative to the relationship between the mind and the body and how technology fits with one or both or either, I still think that his main argument relates more to Hale's post-human argument that we are information processing machines. So to move now over to Donna Haraway, I want to take up now uh, Haraway's definition of the cyborg and then contrast it with Andy Clark's post-human cyborg definition. So Haraway writes that a cyborg is a cybernetic organism, a hybrid of machine and organism, a creature of social reality as well as a creature of fiction. She adds, liberation rests on the construction of the consciousness, the imaginative apprehension of oppression and so of possibility. The cyborg then is a matter of fiction and lived experience that changes what counts as women's experience in the late 20th century. This is one of the most important parts of Haraway's argument that Clark doesn't reckon with at all and I think is often left out of discussions of the cyborg when referring to Haraway. The cyborg for Haraway is a way for women to break out of oppressive dualistic binaries, binaries like the male-female binary, the human-machine binary, and even the human-animal binary. So the cyborg is a way out of a patriarchal, capitalist understanding of what it means to be human, what it means to be a body, and specifically what it means to be a female gendered body. In her section called Fractured Identities, she takes up this issue um, with the representation or, or understanding, cultural understanding of women and women's identities. Um, she writes, painful fragmentation among feminists, not to mention among women, along every possible fault line has made the concept of woman elusive, an excuse for the matrix of women's dominations of each other. Understanding women in this way, understanding them as um, reduced to their gender or their race or their class, uh, constructs a kind of postmodernist identity out of otherness and difference. This postmodernist identity is fully political, whatever might be said about other possible postmodernism. I really like this section because Haraway is talking about the ontological and the epistemological issues with contemporary feminism in that it has a tendency to fragment women based on lines of experience, on lines of race, on class. And as a result, this sense of feminism either otherwise incorporates other sorts of experiences or marginalizes them to form the sense of a coherent, totalizing notion of what feminism is. So the cyborg then is a way to reckon with political, patriarchal, hegemonic, capitalist culture. One of my favorite lines in this manifesto, Haraway writes, the cyborg is a kind of disassembled and reassembled postmodern collective and personal self. This is the self feminists must code. I think that this is one of the most telling, most important two sentences in her whole manifesto. And the problem that we run into when we compare this idea to what Andy Clark is saying is that the similarities between Clark cyborg and Haraway cyborg ends at the technology human coupling. Clark's argument is that we are cyborgs, that we always have been cyborgs, that we were that we we're naturally born cyborgs, right? Um, in that our plastic brains allow us to incorporate fully technologies into our bodies to expand our sense of of knowing, of proprioception, etc. And Haraway's cyborg is 
explicitly a way to reckon with oppressive cultural hegemonic binaries. There's not much of a comparison there really at all. And so in Clark's book, he takes up a lot of the common discussions of the relationship between technology and humans and how they come together. But I just don't like the fact that he uses the term cyborg because when referring to Haraway's cyborg, it's so much more nuanced, um, it's so much more political, and has such a, a stronger sense of um, intent and purpose concerning changing, you know, cultural constructions and whatnot. Whereas Clark is really just interested in the ways that technologies allow us to do more things which is great and something that we should consider and his book definitely has a place in culture but I think he's really making more of an argument about being post-human um, in general rather than specifically being a cyborg. <laughs>